right, let's do this. A few weeks ago, we talked about plotting act one with Save the Cat. You can find it here or in the description below. And today's video is going to be about how to plot act two according to Save the Cat. So the end of act one and the beginning of act two had a very unique transition point. I find this transition incredibly important to the story that you want to tell. And because of that, I created my own video on how to really make the most of your act one to act two transition, which you can find here or in the description below. So the next beat after your act two transition is your B story. This B story is about the secondary character, maybe multiple secondary characters that help your protagonist grow and learn the theme of the story. Now there's two things about this B story character or characters that's important to know. The first thing is that they must represent this act two world. So we talked about act one being the ordinary world and act two being this new, very different world or mentality, state of mind, whatever the case. And this new B story character needs to be from this new world. And the second thing that's important to note about this character is that they must help guide the hero to the theme, to that life lesson, to help them grow and become the person that they need to become. So if you've never seen the Save the Cat Writes a Novel book, here it is by Jessica Brody. Wonderful book, highly suggested. If you're interested in purchasing it, it's in the description below. So I'm gonna quickly read a paragraph from the book talking more about the B story character. It says, but why should the B story character be a product of a new world? Because remember, the hero can't learn the theme and complete their transformation in their act one status quo life. That's why we gave them their catalyst to kick them into act two. Therefore, the person who's helping them learn that the theme should exist in this new world. Otherwise, they could have learned the exact same theme by staying exactly where they were. And what's the fun in that? Now, when it comes to act two, there's a whole lot about the act two that I could really go off on tangents about. I'm going to try not to, but something I do want to point out to you is to really take a look at your own life, your own experiences, and think about your quote unquote, your B characters, the people who have really changed and influenced your life, whether in a negative way or a positive way. You know, later on in life, I had another teacher, I called him coach and coach really changed my entire mindset about so many different things. The most influential part of him and his teachings for me was that I, I kind of grew up thinking that I would be the person in the background helping someone else become great one day. And he really nailed into me that just because I'm a woman, I don't have to, I don't have to cater to a man and think that my, my goal in life is to make another person great. I also have a best friend. I, I actually had two best friends growing up. Both of them were named Brittany and I talked about one of my best friends, Brittany, and this is another Brittany. And she had just an incredible impact on how I became a mother, my mindset on motherhood. And I thought I would be the worst mom ever. I was terrified. I had a horrible marriage and I was bringing a child into the world. Um, and she just really helped me develop like, it's okay, you're never gonna be ready. You know, it's not what you have, it's how you behave. And anyway, long story short, she really changed my outlook on how to be a mom. And that is the most important thing in my life right now. And I wouldn't be where I am today and as happy as I am today if she didn't take the time to guide me in that way. And lastly, it's my family. I have an incredible father, an incredible brother. I have a wonderful mother. I have a wonderful sister-in-law and in very different ways, each of them have helped me grow and develop even past like my childhood and my teenage years, but even as an adult. When you're looking for these B story characters and you're drawing sources of inspiration, reflect on your mentors in life, even if they're younger than you or the same age as you or someone that was just in your life for a short moment. You know, there are these people that come and go in our lives and we're blessed to meet them and we learn from them. And so just reflect on that and really make your 
B story characters as real and as meaningful as possible. And I think you will find that this gives your story that additional layer of depth. All right, so the next part is going to be your fun and games. And I absolutely dislike this title because it's really misleading. And instead of thinking about it as fun and games, I want you to think about it as the why would somebody read your story? So let's talk about how people talk about movies and stories real quickly. And I think this is going to give you just a ton of insight and completely change your attitude towards the middle. When you talk to somebody about The Hunger Games, are you like, oh my gosh, you should totally watch this movie. It's about District 12 and about this girl who goes out and hunts to feed her family. That's not what you say. You're like, oh my gosh, you should see this movie, The Hunger Games, because there's this girl that goes to this capital and there's all of these crazy things that happen, but she's in a actual like life or death contest with other kids her age. And she has to fight to the death it is the Hunger Games. It is insane. Let's talk about Game of Thrones real quick. When you mention Game of Thrones, are you like, oh my gosh, when the family is like all together and they're in Winterfell, isn't that the best moment of the entire series? <laughs> no. You don't go, oh, you know what? When Daenerys is in Essos and right before she meets Khal Drogo, oh, you gotta see that part. No. That's not what people talk about. People talk about the politics of King's Landing. People talk about the wall. They talk about the conquest of Marine and Young Kai and Astropor. You know, they, they talk about those features. I would say as a young teenage writer, one of the earliest misconceptions that I had was the middle of the book. It felt sluggish, it felt horrible. I absolutely despised it. And as I've grown older, something that I've realized is the middle of the book is the exciting part. It is what draws readers to read it. It's what draws watchers to watch the show. It is seriously the best thing about your book. And if you glaze over it because to you it's boring, this part is like half of your book. It's the part that excites people. Don't make it boring. Don't feel like you got to trudge through it just to get to this awesome ending because if you feel like that then the reader is never going to see that awesome ending because they're trudging as important as it is to set up your act one in a wonderful way and to introduce your characters in special ways it is equally important to remember that act two is what people talk about it is the why people will talk about your story so let's go back to the fun and games of it right so it's not fun and games for your character it is fun and games for your reader this is the exciting part for your reader to read and it's probably the reason they picked up the book and so usually another misconception that people have about this fun and games is that your hero is either achieving tons of false victories or tons of false defeats. Personally, I believe you will lean one way or another. Your character will either have more false defeats than false victories or vice versa. When I think of false victories, it is where your protagonist is achieving and achieving for the better. So if you look at something like Harry Potter, Harry Potter is really thriving at Hogwarts. That's not to say that he doesn't come across some type of antagonistic forces, right? Malfoy picks on him. He has Snape over his shoulder all the time. There are these rules that he has to learn. So he's not always win, 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 win. But at the end of the day, Harry definitely thrives in this new world and this new society. Then let's go back to the Hunger Games. When we're looking at the fun and games, the actual games, well, it's not very fun for Katniss Everdeen, right? The odds have not been in her favor. And I'm trying to remember everything off the top of my head, but you know, Katniss has the horrible burn. I think she has the uh, tracker jackers, stinger thingers. You know, she's actually being hunted by career tribute. It's not all fun and games for her, but as a reader, it's really interesting and fun for us to read, right? But unlike Harry Potter, Katniss is not experiencing and thriving in this environment. So she is experiencing more false defeats. Yes, she gets a supplies pack. Yes, she's able to run away and really do well in the woods. 
yes, sponsors are sending her stuff, right? So she gets a few wins in there, but for the most part, she's not thriving. It's a false defeat. And so all of these fun and games are setting us up to the halfway point of your book, which is called the midpoint. According to Save the Cat, there are two main reasons for the midpoint. One, the stakes need to be raised. This is super important. If you don't know much about raising stakes, I'm going to be making a video this week to go over how to raise stakes. So check out my channel. If it's something you're interested in, hit subscribe, ring the bell to get notifications for when that video releases. But the goal is to one, raise stakes. Two, it is to have your character make that decision point. So in a way, your character commits to actively resisting or engaging or whatever with the antagonistic forces. I'm going to quickly go over how the fun and games ties into this. First, we talked about Harry Potter and the fun and games, how he's thriving at Hogwarts. So what that means is that Harry was experiencing false victories. And so at the midpoint, you're going to give him a false defeat. So the midpoint in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, for example, is that Harry comes across and sees Voldemort drinking unicorn blood. This really raises the stakes because it's like, oh my gosh, not only is Voldemort real, he's here on campus and he's this close to me. And this is when Harry Potter makes the decision to protect the Sorcerer's Stone from Voldemort. Now let's go to our Hunger Games example. Katniss has been experiencing false defeats this whole time. For the most part, she's gotten her butt kicked. Now at the midpoint, she is going to get her false victory. This is that moment where she and Rue start to team up. Not only is she able to escape the career tributes, but she is also able to destroy the supplies at the cornucopia with Rue. Again, the stakes become raised. She pretty much put a huge target on her back by destroying the cornucopia supplies. And then that is her very first action. That is her saying, I'm going to resist antagonistic forces. I am becoming active. I am going against it. So remember, if your character is thriving at the midpoint, you need to give them a false defeat. If your character has been getting their butt kicked during the fun and games, the midpoint, you're going to be giving your character a false victory. So that is going to lead us to our next beat, which is going to be the bad guys close in. So during these fun and games, during this midpoint, at the end of the day, the main antagonistic forces have not been just like, you know, filing their nails, waiting for something exciting to happen. They've been plotting, they've been planning, and they're about to put it on your character. Now the bad guys close in is multiple scenes. It's not just one scene, not just one chapter. It's going to be about 25% of your book. So you want to start smaller and then it's going to snowball. And when we talk about the antagonistic forces, we're talking about the big bad. We're talking about the annoying little bads. We're talking about your character's flaw, right? Because they still haven't learned the theme of the story. So their flaw is going to just keep kicking their butt. You know, if your hero has a team, your hero's team is going to start unraveling at this moment. And while it might start off, pretty easy to ignore. They're going to force your character to hit another breaking point. So it starts bad and it gets horrible fast. And if you remember in act one, we had a catalyst. Everything was piling up on your character and your character eventually went through something horrible and traumatic. And eventually that led into going into the new world and to this act two. And that is where the bad guys close in is going to lead your characters. Again, your character, bad stuff, bad stuff, bad stuff, worse stuff, worse stuff, horrible stuff, close to breaking point. And then here comes the next beat. The next beat is the all is lost beat. Your hero hits rock bottom. This is a single scene beat and it is going to be big. It's going to be impactful and it is going to make your character never want to get up again. Usually if your story has people dying, this is when they die. But even if you don't have people dying, this is where something should end. So a quick paragraph from Save the Cat says, basically something should end here because all is lost where the old world character way of thinking finally dies. So a new world character or way of thinking can be born. And whatever ends, whatever dies, 
should be your hero's fault. Again, you're bringing them to their breaking point. And there is nothing worse than something bad happening and the only person you can blame is yourself. The all is lost is going to bring us into the dark night of the soul. So this is our next beat. And it is, I would say like self-loathing, the wallowing. You've probably seen your favorite characters go through this moment where they are just like, I'm done. It's my fault. Woe is me. That's gonna be how this starts. By the end of the dark night of the soul scene, your character is going to have their aha moment. They're going to get that final clue for the mystery. They're going to have this epiphany that, oh my gosh, this, this is what I need to do. And just like the debate moved them into act two, this dark night of the soul moves them into the final act, act three. Now there's one more important thing that I need to bring up. During this um, dark night of the soul, usually characters go back to comfort of some sort. So you'll see sometimes they go back to their ordinary world, or maybe they're going back to live with mom and dad. They do something that's familiar to them and that brings them comfort because that's naturally what people do. When they come back to the ordinary world, they are going to perceive this world differently now because of all of the things that they've learned and experienced in act two. It doesn't feel the same. They've grown as a person, so their perspectives have changed. So congratulations, we are now finished with Save the Cat act two beats. I really hope you found this helpful and I can't wait to get into the next step of this video which is raising the stakes. If you got value from this video hit the like button. If you're interested in more of these videos please check out my channel, hit subscribe, ring the bell, and I hope to hear from you guys in the comments below. Bye!